morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jessica Deganzik, the Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. We are pleased to welcome you to today's program, a conversation with Reed Schuler, Senior Advisor to Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, and moderated by Professor Christine Lowe, former Under Secretary for the Environment in Hong Kong's Tsai Lung government and professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology's Institute of the Environment. She is also a visiting professor at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Thank you also to our event partner, UCLA Anderson Center for Global Management, and those UCLA Anderson students and alumni that are joining us for today's discussion. We'll be taking your questions in about 35 minutes. You can submit your questions by entering them on the question section on the control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll get to as many of those questions as possible. Before the conversation begins, I'd like to welcome Irina Karmanova. She's a public affairs officer in the Office of Public Liaison for the Bureau of Global Public Affairs at the U.S. State Department. She'll make some brief remarks, followed by a short video, and then we'll be joined by Reed and Professor Lowe. Irina, thank you so much for joining us today and helping to make today's event happen. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I work in the Office of Public Liaison, and we're tasked with connecting the Department of State to domestic audiences, directly engaging the American people through outreach efforts, such as this one, designed to better inform the American public of current foreign policy priorities. We do, these, uh, we do this outreach through briefings, conferences, and other events in Washington, D.C., and virtually all around the country. And we engage with not only World Affairs Councils, but Rotary Clubs, high schools, uh, colleges and universities, and many more civil society organizations. Uh, we put on these events um, on a variety of foreign policy topics. We're very excited for this particular event as we have a fantastic speaker here for you today on a very crucial topic that's impacting all of us. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. And Irina, I appreciate you joining us. And now I will turn it over to Professor Lowe and to Reed Schuler. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will be back in about 35 minutes with our audience questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Let me start. Um, I mean, President Biden, he took office with a extensive climate plan, and it's an ambitious plan that lies at the heart of his domestic and his foreign policy. He created new posts to deal with climate, and he appointed people like John Kerry. Uh, and the US has uh, ambitious pledged that by 2030, it would um, cut greenhouse gases by 50% compared to 2005 levels, that there would be a carbon-free power sector by 2035, and that the United States would achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. All of these are huge commitments. And I can't think of a better person than Ruth Schuller, who is the senior advisor to John Kerry, to share some perspectives with us today. Um, and while Reid is focusing on the international side of uh, the climate challenge for the Biden administration, I think it's important perhaps that we start by referring to some aspects of uh, what's happening domestically, because I think the more that the US is able to achieve domestically, the more um, influential it is going to be on the international stage. So Reid, perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about um, uh, the achievements that have been done in just the first few months of uh, the Biden administration. There is uh, the National Climate Task Force, you know, uh, tell us something about that. How often does it meet? What's on the agenda? And maybe also fill us in on the infrastructure bill, because some of the spending there also has an impact on the environment and on climate. So Reid, over to you. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Christine. And uh, you're kind to say that you couldn't imagine a better speaker. I can imagine a number, but they weren't available today. So I will fill in. And it's a pleasure to be here in conversation with you. And thanks to our sponsors for hosting. So indeed, President Biden hit the ground running with this administration with an extraordinary commitment to addressing climate change, both domestically and internationally. And you know, his vision is really that Climate change is a crisis, perhaps the crisis of the century, and it requires an all of government approach that treats it like the crisis that it is. And so not only did President Biden put in place two new roles, both Secretary Kerry, my boss, as the first ever special presidential envoy for climate, but also 
Gina McCarthy as the White House National Climate Advisor to oversee all of the president's enormously ambitious domestic agenda. And from the very beginning of the president's transition work to put in place a new government, he prioritized climate. And that meant selecting folks to run agencies and senior staff who had a deep track record in climate work. It meant selecting for a commitment to those efforts. And it meant briefing every single member of his cabinet that climate was going to be a top priority from day one. And the president has made that abundantly clear. So, you know, the efforts to really address U.S. emissions, um, these efforts will go on for many years. This is not a one and done kind of deal. The, the work to transform our economy is work that by necessity is comprehensive and involves not only really ambitious federal work, but also it builds on the incredible leadership of so many local, state, and tribal partners, especially over the past, past four years when there was a real dearth of leadership at the federal level. Um, and as this event is hosted by the uh, LA World Affairs Council, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't recognize the leadership of Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, who the president has recognized for his leadership such that he is, um, in fact, you know, working to poach the mayor from his service to the people of Los Angeles for additional international work. Um, and the kind of leadership by cities and states and counties and tribes to set and achieve ambitious targets to phase out fossil fuels in the power sector, to clean up our vehicles, to, to improve transit services for people, to modernize and electrify buildings. All of this work provides an enormous jumping off point for a national government that can point to proven models working on the ground, that can use the public support that local and state leaders have built over years um, and, and push to go even farther working together with those partners. So just, just a few answers to your question, Christine, about what this administration has already done just in the early days on the domestic climate front. So, you know, first, I think the infrastructure bill that is continuing to move represents a pretty profound bipartisan breakthrough on a number of fronts. So in addition to much, much needed investments in all kinds of transportation infrastructure across the country to repair the nation's crumbling bridges and roads, transit hubs, other pieces of critical infrastructure, this package would make some, some remarkable investments in much needed elements of the president's climate plan. It's the largest federal investment ever in transit. It's the largest investment in rail since the creation of Amtrak. It provides significant investments in electric vehicle charging infrastructure, infrastructure that we need if we're going to work with car companies and Americans to ramp up electric vehicle sales to the level the president has called for, um, and, and a really significant investment in starting to transform our transit and school buses to electric and zero emission ones. So the infrastructure bill represents a, a pretty extraordinary move forward, and we're excited to see that continue to move. Um, would also reference the really exciting announcement that just came out within the last weeks that coupled an executive order by the president to set a target of achieving 50% zero emission vehicle sales by 2030. Um, and that was a statement that was supported by labor voices and key automakers in the country. So represents what we're able to do when we work together and, and accompanied by draft rulemaking by EPA and the Department of Transportation to help launch our vehicle standards you know, really into the 21st century to save consumers money, to reduce emissions, and to help propel our electrification goals. So um, those are just a few of the things I would mention. The work continues. I guess, actually, Christine, you, you asked about the National Climate Task Force, and I think that's a really important point. This National Climate Task Force is convened by National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy, herself an extraordinarily dedicated and experienced public service, public servant with experience running the Environmental Protection Agency. Her mission for the president is to convene all of our domestic agencies and um, to really work on driving emission reductions in every single sector of the economy. So she's calling together the president's cabinet and a variety of senior White House advisors to check in on how we can continue to push these efforts to the maximum extent possible. Um, and, you know, that's a kind of whole of government effort that we really haven't seen before and it's continuing to drive forward. That's terrific. Well, I'm sure you'll get some questions from the audience later on of, you know, what you can do during this administration 
that will stay because one of the questions being asked uh, both domestically and internationally is the election cycles. But I think I'm going to leave those questions to uh, the audience. Uh, we want to maximize your time in talking about the international stage, which is uh, what, what you're working on. So if we were to look back in the last administration, I mean, obviously, um, it's very different from this one. And even if we went back to the Obama administration, what is different today in how you deal with uh, uh, foreign policy and climate than in past administration? What's new? Great question. Well, I, you know, I think at the very kind of top of that answer needs to be this fundamental question about the way in which fighting the climate crisis is prioritized in American foreign policy. And there's no question that fighting the climate crisis was a significant priority in the Obama administration, particularly in the second term. Um, and yet, there are always going to be a variety of competing priorities. And there's a difference between ensuring that something is on the agenda, that senior folks are in place and taking care of it, and that the president is taking it seriously, and ensuring that it is always on the agenda, that indeed in many cases at the top of the agenda, and that you're making clear throughout your foreign affairs policymaking bodies that it's a top priority that needs to be integrated into everything that we do. And so from day one at the State Department and at other foreign facing policy bodies in the US, this administration has been very, very clear the, the kind of primacy of fighting the climate crisis. So that means it's integrated into our commercial diplomacy. It's integrated into the way that we train new foreign service officers and help to, to build our workforce. It's integrated into the way that ambassadors and senior staff of the United States are assessed for performing their goals. And it means that the Secretary of State, in addition to the special, special presidential envoy for climate, is raising climate in nearly every single one of his meetings. So I think the way in which the United States makes clear to our partners abroad just what a priority of the climate crisis occupies for us can't be understated. You know, one thing that other countries really look for in their interactions with the United States and other countries is for consistency. If they hear from an ambassador that a given issue is a priority, but then in their conversation with the Secretary of State, they don't hear that issue repeated, then they think maybe it's a hobby of the ambassadors. Um, if they hear from the Secretary of State, but not the President, they think that's eh, a certain priority, but you know it stops at a certain level. But when, when our foreign interlocutors hear at every single level from the most junior foreign service officer, the ambassador, Secretary of State, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, and indeed the President in leader level meetings that we take this seriously, these countries know that it is a serious bedrock priority of the United States. Um, and and that, that helps for us to have maximum leverage in our conversations with a variety of, of partners and competitors alike that we're gonna do whatever is in our power to do to, to maximize you know, our bilateral efforts to increase climate action and our, our work with partners across the globe. I mean, would you say that this is the first time where climate has such a dominance and priority in uh, foreign affairs in the United States? I think so. I mean, I think we've been we've been building on these efforts in many ways, right? And so this administration in foreign affairs has diverse new voices, and it also has a variety of trusted, experienced national security professionals who professionals who have served in former administrations. And I think you can look at a number of them and see the work that those folks have been doing um, even over the last four years to help to integrate work fighting climate change into a wide variety of American institutions. So I've been talking just now about the way that this administration helps to ensure that climate change is always on our foreign policy agenda and high up there but really, I think if you step back and you look at the way that American civil society has been treating the, the, the climate crisis, activists, tribes, corporate boardrooms, nonprofits, state cities, I think there's an increasing drumbeat of that happening in a variety of places. I was privileged before taking this role to work for Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, and he is a climate leader. He integrates climate 
into all of the work that he did. But in some ways, while I would say when I first joined his staff, that was a bit of a rarity, I was immensely encouraged to see that over the last four years, increasingly, climate change was at the top of the priority list for a large number of governors across the country. And you see these coalitions growing. At the state level, we have the United States Climate Alliance, which persists and has governors representing more than half of the country's economy who were dedicated to pursuing these efforts over the last four years. And everything that we do at the international level builds upon not only what we can put in place in terms of federal policy, but also the efforts of so many actors across the country to maximize their efforts. So really, American foreign policy sits atop a huge domestic base of commitment, and it includes commitments from, from labor, from car companies, from manufacturers, and, and so many others. And that lets us speak with a much louder and more credible voice in the international front. Right. And, you know, when you're speaking internationally, I mean, obviously, you're dealing with governments, uh, you know, other countries at different stages of development. And you're also dealing with countries where, you know, you have some conflict with, uh, like China, for example, that is the largest carbon emitter in the world today. So, um, so how are you dealing with all this diversity of your partners uh, externally? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I would like to say that it's simple, but it's not. Um, and, you know, it, it is really important to say that this administration has always made clear that it believes in having multiple aspects to one relationship with another country. That is, for a variety of countries, we may have areas of our relationship that are defined by competition and areas of our relationship that are defined by mutually seeking progress on critical global goals. And so climate is obviously one of those where we have to be able to partner with a wide variety of countries and continue to make progress as a global community, even when we have significant friction in a, in a number of areas in our bilateral relationships. I think fighting COVID-19 is another one of those clear areas where despite those frictions, we have to be able to come together as a global community and continue to talk about vaccine distribution, about how we coordinate travel, how we strengthen our institutions to prepare for the next pandemic. And so, um, you know, we, we have clearly said we will not trade on other issues um, for climate. That is to say, we will not relax American standards that are high when they come to standing up for critical values, human rights, democratic participation, and other areas. We're not willing to sacrifice on those, but we are willing to continue to have conversations on the climate crisis, which is an urgent priority. And, and Secretary Kerry has been very clear um, internally and externally that he is gonna continue to pursue his mission that he has received from the president of working closely with partners of all stripes, including other countries with whom we have significant tension in our relationships. Well, can you tell us something about how you deal with, for example, uh, developing countries in Asia, in Africa, you know, that uh, has coal as its one, you know, its domestic uh, uh, resources? And obviously, we want everybody to use a lot less coal. Um, what kind of conversations do you have with these countries? Yeah. Well, how so, can we help, right? How can we help them all to uh, decarbonize? Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, I think during the negotiations of the Paris Agreement, in the run up to its conclusion in 2015, there was a, a very stark divide in international conversations between a lot of developed and developing countries. And, you know, for some time, there was what seemed like almost a global consensus that we were going to somehow deal with this problem only by developed countries taking responsibility for their emissions, but not with an approach that included the participation of all. And in the run-up to the Paris Agreement and, and through the structure of the Paris Agreement itself, we had a series of fairly profound, profound breakthroughs, which centered on this notion that effectively addressing the climate crisis was going to require efforts by all. And that those efforts would look different based on country situations. So, you know, you wouldn't see new vehicle electrification standards that look identical in the United States 
for the European Union or Japan to what you might see in a country with a very low economic development status. Um, but that what you would see was, was each country working to understand what more it could do on its own and with international resources. And Secretary Kerry is very devoted to the goal of helping to mobilize additional both public and private financial resources to help a variety of, of developing countries that really need some significant assistance to move faster. Um, we're seeing a lot of encouraging signs. And so last year, more than 80% of new electricity power generation put in place across the globe was from renewable sources. So that's, I mean, you just can't overstate the significance of that shift from years past. And that means that we're seeing enormous renewables growth, even in a variety of developing countries that have previously put forward arguments about the, the challenges of finding cost competitive renewable resources compared to cheap coal. The economics are changing very fast and renewable prices have fallen very rapidly. Um, and countries are increasingly recognized that there are a variety of non-monetary costs of coal. There are enormous health challenges associated with the burden of significant coal resources. Um, there are oftentimes unfair economic terms involved in doing some of the deals that involve seeking financial resources for new coal development in the first instance. And so in our work with developing countries, we proceed along multiple channels. We have really important development assistance relationship with a whole range of countries. So the US Agency for International Development is providing significant amounts of technical assistance to countries in helping to do that overall planning for how they can look at their power sectors, how they can look at transportation, how they can deal with a, with a wide variety of challenges and helping them to break through technical issues. We're having those political conversations about the risks of continuing to invest in coal and the value of continuing to turn away from the most carbon intensive resources and toward carbon free resources. Because we've all seen not only the really important scientific reports coming out of the IPCC, but we've also experienced the impacts. This year has been an incredible year in terms of feeling the pain of climate change that is already here with us. And that's not even to think about the, the incredible danger of, of the climate crisis at higher levels of warming. And we know that the impacts of climate change are nonlinear, that at twice as much warning, warming as we're experiencing today, the impacts will be more than twice as great as the already catastrophic impacts we're facing from flooding in places that haven't experienced it before to extreme heat that is killing some of our most vulnerable people and, and reaching record temperatures in places we never could have imagined from Siberia to the US Northwest. Um, to really out of control fires in a whole range of places that have just not seen fire like this before. So I think those, those impacts are, are increasingly present in the minds of not only people around the world, but, but policymakers and for developing countries who are some of the most vulnerable impact, most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, there's an increasing recognition to um, you know, what it will take to get there together and, and to, to stop the increase in temperature it won't be enough to have action just from developed countries or even just from developed and major developing countries, but it will really take a transformation of the entire world's economy, and that's one that will require everyone. Well, I think uh, as we go into COP26, which is going to be in November, this is the next uh, UN summit on climate change. Uh, I wonder what you see are the challenges, because one of the, th I mean, accepting everything that you said, uh, I think from the developing world, uh, the economies or the, the governments of those countries are also saying that whilst they are building renewable resources, uh, they are actually having to also increase uh, the energy that they need for development. So in fact, uh, if you're looking at any of the develop major developing economies, uh, if we look, if, if we stretch out, you know, 10, 20 years, we're talking about many of them increasing their energy needs many folds. So, you know, it's a real challenge for them. So I wonder as we go into COP26, uh, what you think the US would like to achieve, uh, how some of these conversations are going to be negotiated. Uh, and also uh, one of the problems of the Paris Agreement is they're supposed to be 
a massive transfer of funds and technology from the developed to the developing economies. And one of the complaints from the developing economies is that they're not seeing some of this funding. So as you go into COP26, uh, what are the challenges and what would you like to see as uh, a successful outcome? Absolutely. So, you know, this year is really a pivotal year. And what we need to do for COP26 is, is both alarming in its scale and urgency, and it's also inspiring in the scale of the opportunity for us to collectively take action. So we're, we are really at the end of this first five-year cycle of the Paris Agreement that in its central mechanism calls upon countries to put forward targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, so-called nationally determined contributions or NDCs. And Christine, this is what you refer to when you describe President Biden's commitment to reduce US emissions by 50 to 52% below 2005 levels in 2030. You know, a, a, a really ambitious commitment to slash American emissions in half from 2005. And so, so this is this period of time in which all countries are asked to revisit the goals, the commitments that they put forward in 2015. Um, for the Paris Agreement negotiations. And in many cases, those commitments are quite stale. They represent relatively conservative first efforts from countries to put forward cautious commitments about what those countries might do. And fast forwarding six years from when many of those countries originally put forward those targets, countries have already made significant progress in bending the curve of future emissions. They have mothballed plans to develop coal power. They have built renewables faster than they believe possible. Many countries have made significant progress in addressing some of the most critical deforestation and other land-based challenges resulting in significant emissions. So, so it's, a, it's an important time for countries to reassess and, and decide not only where they have already made progress that they can build on, but to understand given the state of the crisis, what more is required from the global community. And, and like with other global issues, I think so much is wrapped up in this feeling of momentum, that each country feeling that it is in the position of, of looking around the global community to understand where other countries are and where they are going. And countries don't like to be left behind where there is a critical mass of commitment and action. And so Secretary Kerry's work this year is laser focused on working with heads of state and ministers in other key countries to push all other countries in the world, but particularly major economies and major emitters to say, we are coming to COP26, deepening our commitment to reducing emissions by 2030 and doing so in a way that is consistent with keeping hope alive for limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius that if we don't achieve that key goal, we will have failed in an opportunity to really dramatically limit the critical impact of climate change around the world. And so that is, the, that is really at the center of his conversations with other countries. It is about how can you look across the suite of work that you have underway to deal with all of these critical challenges and how can you aim for more? And those goals to reduce emissions absolutely need to be backed up by domestic implementation. But they are also significant goals that will require comprehensive action across different parts of our economy, using different agencies and ministries to make progress, working with leading partners on the ground like mayors and governors. And they are not things that get solved over the course of a week or a month or a year. So sometimes what we hear back from countries is, we know that the world needs to get there. We know that the world needs to get there together. And we know that requires more of us. But we can't immediately tell you how we're going to get to more ambition in 2030. And part of our challenge is to respond both with an offer of technical assistance to help answer some of the real thorny questions about implementation, to help offer assurances of increased financial assistance over time for countries that need it, and also to offer reassurance that we are going to work to get there together. And that what's required in this moment is 
aiming higher and redoubling our efforts at home to get there, not to be able to dot every single I and cross every single T in answering exactly what we will do over the next 10 years and then the remaining 20 years to get to net zero by 2050, um, because this is a monumental task and it's gonna require persistent efforts over many years. But that's what's at stake for this COP, is about coming together and asking all countries to do more. Right, so I think we're gonna open up for Q&A very soon, but let me just um, ask you one more question. I think what I'm hearing you saying is um, that the Paris Agreement, you know, all the commitments that people put on the table, uh, in a way was the first time that it was some kind of bottom-up approach. People put forward what they thought they could do, and also people realized that it wasn't going to make it, you know, that this was not going to, in fact, be uh, even under two degrees. So now you're saying the science is such that we really need to go for 1.5 degrees, and we're at about 1.1 or 1.2 degrees already, right? So you are asking, am I right, that uh, uh, Mr. Kerry is going around the world trying to get countries to up their commitments. And that, and is that the judge of uh, your success in a way, uh, or collective success for the signatories of the Paris Agreement, the extent to which commit, new commitments will be made? Could I put it that way? Does that make sense? I think that's a great way to summarize it, Christine. So, so I think that is, that is the, the sort of first question is, how much are the world's countries, and particularly its major countries, coming forward with new commitments that are actually in line with where we need to go as a global economy? There are a huge range of other important efforts underway too. So while that is a dominant one, it's not the only one. So some of our work is really about advancing progress in different sectors and you know, pick your piece of the national or global economy there is work to do to transform that part of the economy into one that is consistent with fighting the climate crisis and best for our health and getting ahead of, of economic changes. And there is cooperation going on across those areas. So, you know, even as we work to transition the world away from fossil fuels, there is urgent work to do to address methane leakage from existing oil and gas operations that are not going away overnight in many places. So there is political and technical work to help accelerate efforts to address, for example, fugitive emissions from the oil and gas sector. In, in the vehicle space, there is a wide range of work to share um, policies in, in the space of how do, we, how do we speed the transition to electric vehicles. And it's not, you know, as with any of these big challenges, there's not just one tool. There are a suite of you know, regulatory efforts to ensure that manufacturers are moving along. There are supply chain conversations to ensure that we are getting ahead of shortages of critical minerals and other parts that go into building the batteries of the future that we can actually build these things. There are labor conversations going on to ensure that we are getting ahead of workforce challenges and helping to address shifting needs at home, that we're taking care of our employees in these companies. There are questions about consumer incentives. So, so you know, just on the vehicles front, we have conversations going with many countries about how we can move this work forward. And, and the COPs, the, these, these global climate conferences, they're almost you know, dizzying in the diversity of different efforts happening. Not only are there formal negotiations going on between national governments, but there are parallel and integrated conversations going on with, with governors, mayors, major companies, different agencies working on efforts. And, and so there's so much that, that is going on and I think will be announced below just the level of what is the top line commitment of a country to reduce emissions. And, and there's a really a lot to be encouraged by. At the same time that we recognize just how much more needs to be done, it's also important to reflect as a community on how far we've come and there's a lot of promise in the progress that we have made that should buoy our efforts um, toward the next round, right? If we were in a place where we thought we've been talking about this for decades and we've made no progress, that would inspire a lot of hopelessness. But in fact, we've seen major shifts on the ground, uh, major shifts caused by a mix of, of local and national leaders um, on just about every front. And so now we have 
major solutions in our toolkits that are proven solutions. And so much of the work now is about how do you deploy those at, a, at an even faster clip? Right. Well, let me hand uh, Q&As back to Jessica, who's been collecting questions from uh, the audience. Jessica. Thank you so much. Before we launch into the Q&A session, I would like to thank our viewers for your continued support. We depend upon your donations and membership to cover our expenses so that we continue to, to bring you these important discussions. If you are able to make a donation, please go to our website at www.lawacth.org and click on the donate button or become a member. We greatly appreciate your support. All right, let's jump into these questions. Um, read, marvelous presentation. Many workers are concerned about job loss in this transformation of the economy. Can you share any good examples of how it can go well for labor? Yeah, really, 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 really important question. How do we center workers and labor in this transition? And how do we paint a vision and implement that vision of ensuring that workers aren't left behind? You know, hard, hard to name more crucial questions. And, and there's a process point here, which is that we have to integrate those concerns into everything that we do. Um, I know, for example, that uh, Secretary of Energy, um, former Governor Jennifer Granholm, has a new advisor just to assist her on workforce transition issues to ensure that those concerns are integrated into all the work that the Department of Energy does. So there are process answers. On the policy front, um, you know, there are a variety of important efforts. So again, I mentioned that I um, come to this position having most recently served Governor Jay Inslee in Washington. Washington State passed a leading 100% clean electricity law, um, pointing the pathway to zero carbon emissions in the power sector. And that law contained really important provisions that help to maximize incentives for utilities and for clean energy developers in um, supporting workers, in having uh, project labor agreements that set out high labor standards and prevailing wage for clean energy projects. And, and it created a, a sliding scale where projects that aren't doing a great job of maximizing benefits for workers and communities really aren't getting a lot of benefits under the law. And so, you know, this is a topic that comes up in so many of our conversations with other countries. How do we take care of workers? And there are so many different kinds of workers, workers at a coal power plant that is about to be decommissioned, workers in auto manufacturing, um, prospective workers, that there are you know, really an almost infinite variety of, of answers here. I think there are some really successful apprenticeship programs that are about helping to ensure that we are building the appropriate skills in the next generation of the workforce um, and that we're providing those same opportunities to workers who are in parts of our economy who are shrinking. So, you know, I think no easy answers here, but a huge number of people working at every level to, to answer those really important questions. Thank you. Will there be a fee on carbon and a border adjustment in the reconciliation bill? What will be the wording? Yeah, great question. So yeah, wording of future bills is uh, something that is, you know, not only uh, unknown, even if it were known in the heads of, in the mind of Speaker Pelosi, I would not be able to communicate it yet here on this front. Um, but I mean, so absolutely the reconciliation bill is, is there going to be a really important vehicle for moving some of the administration's really critical climate priorities. And the president has clearly expressed his support for, um, you know, ensuring that we get maximum possible emission reductions from that bill. On the question of whether there will be a US carbon border adjustment mechanism of some kind, um, some kind of fee attached to exchanges of goods where the, we assess that the other country does not have an adequately stringent climate policy in place domestically, those conversations are still happening. And, and I think one of the questions is about whether we're able to work with other country partners to the extent that we actually get to a place where we no longer need to put in place such a policy because we actually do have relatively similarly stringent levels of um, you know, carbon related policies in each country. But those conversations are happening. There's a, there, this administration has said very clearly, they're not taking that tool off the table. They're uh, you know, assessing its importance. We hear a lot from other countries 
on a variety of sides of the issue, certainly concerned about how that kind of mechanism would be created, what it would look like, what its details would be. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the, the main answer to the question is very live conversation, no final answers yet. Thank you. This question is for Professor Lowe. The U.S. response to climate change is long overdue, but a major risk remains coal. Simply put, China and Asia run on coal. China continues to increase coal use both domestically and internationally through its Belt and Road Initiative. Any CO2 decrease achieved in the developed world will be more than offset by China's increase in greenhouse gas emissions to the detriment of all. Can you comment on that? I think uh, we have to recognize some facts and you know what we're trying to do with climate change and decarbonization is a revolution. I mean the world if we take it as a whole uh, fossil fuel is still provides 84% of the energy. So you know that's that's the base we're moving from. Uh, in China uh, coal still makes up about 57% of the energy. So I think for uh, developing countries, they have coal. Uh, coal is gives them a measure of energy security. So to ask them to cut it off from day one, it's obviously impossible. And during my discussion with Reid just now, uh, one of the key conversations in Asian developing economies, uh, and you know there are a number of big economies there where coal is a uh, is, is is a large part of their energy resources is uh, when they can really cut down massively because they need new energy, right? It's not just keeping the lights on today, it's expanding their energy needs so that they can develop. So this kind of balance is a huge deal. So I think in terms of looking at China, which is what I do, is that they've put out plans. Um, uh, in a way, I think the US-China conversation on climate change starting uh, during the Obama administration, where John Kerry and his counterpart in China worked together to put forward pledges uh, that were significant, must continue. So I think for China, uh, there are also domestic interests that perhaps doesn't want to go as fast on ramping down fossil fuel. But nevertheless, in a country like China, it is imperative that the central authorities has a plan and it's put a plan on the table. Of course, people are arguing whether it could go faster. So I think it's really important uh, that US and China, which are the two dominant economies in the world, that they continue to talk and to, in a way, put pressure on each other uh, uh, to, go, to go forward. There are no easy answers to how a, how a whole economy could just get rid of fossil fuels. Thank you. France gets a significant amount of electrical power from nuclear plants. Is there any consideration of increasing our reliance on nuclear power as a source of zero carbon power? Yeah, great question. So let me let me address that from the international frame and, and less in the perspective of how the U.S. is thinking about its own power sector. So, you know, there, there are a number of countries like France where um, nuclear power generation is a significant part of its domestic power generation. The U.S. is relatively significant in that list of countries. And, you know, I think there are sort of two different pieces of that question. One is, how do you think about a country's existing nuclear power fleet and its role in future generation? And the other is how you think about potential um, new nuclear development. And on the first front, you know, it's really critical that if countries choose to decrease reliance on their existing nuclear power, that they have a plan to replace that power with other carbon-free resources. So a central challenge would be if a country decided that its nuclear fleet for a variety of reasons needed to be decommissioned, and that could include that you know, a given reactor was old and approaching the end of its usable, safe lifespan, um, that, that if power is gonna go offline, that there be ways to ensure that that power is not replaced with carbon intensive power. And you know, Japan, in the wake of the Fukushima tragedy, um, uh, you know, immediately took a lot of its nuclear fleet offline in response to that crisis. And unfortunately, what that did is you know, led to a shift of increased reliance on a variety of 
fossil sources. So countries have to think very carefully about the, the pretty significant role in carbon-free power generation that existing nuclear provides and whether their plans are to find ways to safely maximize the lifespan of existing nuclear or to move in another generation. What we can't have is a turn from a significant carbon-free power resource toward fossil fuels. That would be moving in the opposite direction where we need to go. On the front of new nuclear power generation, you know, we really haven't seen hugely significant new nuclear development in a lot of countries in recent years. It's been um, slow from a regulatory perspective. It's been relatively expensive compared to new renewable resources, but there's a lot of interest in the potential role of new generation nuclear technologies particularly because as renewable deployment increases, the challenges of integrating an electricity source like wind or solar is quite variable increases. You know, if you have 10% renewables on the grid, generally no problem to manage the up and down nature of renewables productions. But as that percentage explodes, it's a, it's a harder and harder challenge to deal with. And so for a lot of folks, nuclear represents an attractive source of base load, non-variable, zero carbon power. And there's a lot of enthusiasm about the technology and innovation that will go into creating a future generation of likely smaller scale, uh, more rapidly deployable, and ideally low cost nuclear. So a lot of, lot of interest in this space, and I think no one can provide definitive answers about what the future of nuclear looks like. Thank you. Are you involved in planning to mitigate a potential water crisis in the Western United States? So, so the administration is you know, very focused on the impacts that, that climate change is having on a variety of domestic resources, and, and certainly that includes water resources. Um, Secretary Kerry's role is very focused on leading the president's international agenda. So unfortunately, I can't speak knowledgeably about what the efforts are to take account of climate impacts for threatened water resources throughout the American West and others. Um, but it can certainly say that, you know, from Secretary Holland at the Department of Interior, including um, National Climate Advisor McCarthy, absolutely those impacts are, are going to be at the heart of a domestic response to ensure that we are managing through the, the impacts that are already here with us. Thank you. Um, this is for either panelist. How are the United States and China working in Africa to help them become more climate friendly and green adapted as they continue to develop their infrastructure? Yeah, Christine, do you have thoughts about Belt and Road or other efforts? And I'm happy to say a little. Right. Um, I think China has obviously domestic policies and it has foreign policies and it sees itself as the largest developing economy. And the Belt and Road is designed to kind of be a, an outreach. And what do developing economies need? They need development. And development requires a lot of construction. So I think in the early days when Belt and Road was designed, uh, the climate perspective was less of a priority. But I think today, uh, when China looks at its foreign policy and Belt and Road, obviously climate sustainability have become more and more important because also the receiving country, uh, other developing countries are also preferring technologies and ways of doing things that are more low carbon. So I think as we look at Belt and Road and China's outreach into Africa uh, and other parts of the developing world, uh, we should bear in mind that uh, uh, carbon neutrality uh, is going to be more and more important. So perhaps looking forward for people to track uh, what China is going to do, I think there'll be information on many projects. People are looking at the past, and I think the thing is to look at the future projects to see whether you know coal is financeable. Some of it won't even be financeable. Uh, and maybe the last thing I just want to say about coal is um, in China, uh, their coal plants are uh, ultra super critical. That means they, if you're going to use coal, they are the most efficient. And these were developed at a time, the time of thinking is the developing world like South Africa, Indonesia, India, what they have is coal. So if you tell them that they can't use any of the coal, that's just not practical, but you can build new 
much more efficient coal plants. But also now the pressure is how are you going to uh, phase them out in the next 30 years? Because by 2050, um, we should all be aiming for carbon neutrality. And this is the revolution. How are we all going to work together to get that done? Thank you. Yeah, Did you want to add anything? Sure, I'll, I'll briefly underscore the, the really important, important point that Christine made about the, the increased energy demands that we're going to see in many parts of the world. I mean, so clearly um, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, we want to see you know, more and more reliable energy for people and businesses across the region, right? The, the, the current level of energy provision is too low. So we need to both meet that really pressing human development need to provide, whether it's electricity for kids to read their school books at night, for farmers to be able to irrigate their crops, for industry to be able to reliably power buildings and equipment, you know, all of that is needed. And we, we have to do it in a way that is consistent with our climate goals. And people sometimes have the, what might be a facile analogy to the way in which across some African countries, um, there was a kind of leapfrogging to cell phones rather than an investment in landlines, that by the time there was a real spread of phones, landlines were passe, and there's sort of a hope that there's an analogous situation here with regard to energy systems, that um, you know it is in some senses far too late for the needs of a lot of people. It is, it is tragic that we haven't been able to provide more energy to people in a lot of these places than we have, but that now we're here, it's very unlikely that we're gonna build out a vast new, for example, coal infrastructure across the continent because coal is not in the money anymore. And so you might find a few isolated developments, but by and large, what we have to do here, we have an opportunity to, to build clean from the start. And that is gonna be the focus of so much US development assistance. US has previously had efforts, including what we called Power Africa, to focus on renewables and other clean energy development in the continent. And I think you're gonna see um, more and more of that. One more point, um, Christine talked about how a number of you know, major developing countries like India, South Africa, and Indonesia have had some very significant reliance on coal. I think we're seeing some very promising signs, including in those economies um, of a turn away from coal. So for example, Prime Minister Modi has set a hugely ambitious goal of installing 450 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity um, by the end of this decade. That is uh, a goal that is likely to not only, if it's achieved, prevent the installation of a lot of new coal, but even displace existing coal. In Indonesia, we saw this year an announcement by the state-owned utility PLM of a new moratorium on building coal, that they're still working to develop and create coal phase-down plans. So all of this needs to happen um, sooner and faster but we are seeing a lot of signs of momentum in the right direction. So our work in many places isn't about, you know, completely reversing the direction. It's about going with the trends and helping to accelerate them. Thank you. Uh, for Reid again, uh, and this might have to do with some of your work with Governor Inslee, can you speak at all about regenerative agriculture and how farmers are dealing with climate change and adapting their practices to improve soil, water usage, and crop output? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think that agriculture is, is so essential for the world. It lies at the heart of our food systems. It's an enormous employer in many places. And a variety of agricultural systems, as the question implies, are also significant contributors um, to pollution, whether it's carbon pollution from running um, farm equipment, whether it's methane or nitrous oxide. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the economy that we are going to have to help to transition. There, there is a very high priority on ensuring that farmers and the agricultural industry is not negatively impacted by our climate work. So there's a very high interest in ensuring that we are moving to a system that is based on providing incentives, that is additional resources for farmers and others to be able to put into place new practices and on innovation and technology that will allow us to um, you know, whether it is feed supplements for livestock that are significant methane emitters um, or other technologies that help farmers um, manage their soils in ways that don't release a lot of carbon. There's a, it's, I think it's, it's a burgeoning space. Um, 
we have a, a new international effort that is about building a coalition of countries helping to put in place the appropriate practices to support whether it's regenerative agriculture or other practices that can minimize emissions. Um, but I think, you know, frankly, agriculture is, is at one end of the spectrum in terms of the challenge of reducing emissions. Um, that is, there are some areas where the solutions are here and now in many places, where, for example, in the power sector in many countries, new renewables are already the cheapest source of electricity. They can, we know that they can power a huge portion of the economy with existing technology. There are a number of areas in agriculture where we don't have the solutions here yet. We can't point to the things that we are going to do to you know, eliminate emissions from agriculture. There are a variety of, of activities that do generate some emissions. So lots of work to do here. And, and I think it's about, it's about the collaboration between agriculture, the science and innovation community and policymakers and kind of providing the ecosystem that works for everyone. Thank you. And this will be my final question. What commitments will we make in Glasgow? Oh, spoiling the president's announcements. I hate to do that. Um, you know, I think that what we're going to see is uh, our, the, the British hosts of COP26 in Glasgow have said there will be a portion at the beginning of the meeting overall that is at the leader level. That is, it is heads of state convening to announce what we're going to do. And moments like this are helpful in shining the international spotlight on leaders in a way that maximizes pressure to deliver. Uh, you know, no head of state wants to get up in a forum to talk about what they are doing in a specific effort and fall short. So it's about um, calling upon all to, to showcase new and important domestic efforts to reduce emissions and international partnerships. So uh, we are all in many ways hard at work answering that exact question, that, that question you posed in some ways could be a, an internal assignment uh, you know, from the White House in our case and, and other uh, heads of state offices and others about what those final outcomes are. I think there are a number of countries that are still frankly considering what they will be able to do this year, whether and how they can go farther than they already have. Um, and, and so that is really at the, at the core of the remainder of our work for the year. Um, so, you know, tune in in early November and, and get that answer, that question answered. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that was our last question. So if there's any way that you can share kind of how people can stay in touch with you guys or follow your work, uh, go ahead with that. <laughs> Yeah, for the for the U.S., I would encourage people to uh, follow the special presidential envoy for climate on Twitter, uh, which he's active on. Um, and uh, we put out a lot of our announcements about work we do on uh, whitehouse.gov, announcing what the president is doing to combat climate change. And would just encourage folks uh, in all of your different institutions to be part of the solution, because it really is about um, building those collective efforts. Every new city program to help ensure that you know new buildings are being put up in efficient ways to a faith community talking to its congregants or other worshipers about you know how to reduce emissions from the footprint of their building all of this work adds and combines and generates more momentum and enthusiasm for this work and it truly is a problem that we can't solve without everyone so um, it's something that builds upon the efforts of everyone if people are interested, um, they can find me on LinkedIn and um, I have a website, but I do want to end just by saying that uh, the US and China are very lucky because we have John Kerry on one side and we have Xie Zhenhua on the other side. These are two old battle horses who understand the issue really well, both domestically and internationally. So I think that's good. The, the last thing I just want to say is the world has made a date with destiny between 2050 and 2060, all the countries basically are moving towards carbon neutrality. This is a revolution. We haven't done it before. We don't know all to, how to do it. So as Reid said, everybody needs to cooperate. They need to help each other. So I think all hands on deck and let's do this together. Date with destiny. Thank you so much, Reid, uh, Professor Lowe and Irina for this wonderful insight on the administration's climate policy. This has been a topic that a lot of our members have been asking about. So we'll have to have you back out here in Los Angeles when we can do some in-person programs and continue this discussion. We also really appreciate uh, your time and expertise. And thanks again to UCLA Anderson for their support of today's program. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.